Tremendous promise in that song. No power, no man can pluck me from his hand. You have that security when you're in Christ Jesus. That is a wonderful, wonderful promise. And thank you for leading us this morning. We're in John chapter 3, one of the most favorite passages perhaps of the Bible, and certainly a verse that most memorized, even many non-Christians know it. And if you're watching football, you may see somebody hold up a placard, that says John 3.16, reminding people. The words will be on the screen. I hope you have your Bible and you'll follow along with me as we read verses 3, 1 through 21. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you were doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. Unless a man is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Read this next verse with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send a Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. Join me in prayer. Dear precious Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for Jesus Christ, Lord. We ask that you would open our hearts and minds that we would gain a deeper understanding of your scripture and your work on our behalf. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We start out in Nicodemus, a Pharisee, comes to Jesus and it says he comes in the night. Obviously, it could have been just convenience. Maybe he worked all day, but there's a strong likelihood he was trying to make sure the other Pharisees didn't see him coming to visit Jesus. There was some conflict between the Pharisees and Jesus. And, and Nicodemus, being one of the Pharisees, would have been considered, as they were, an expert in the law. And to come to this itinerant teacher, in their mind, would have seemed like or, or stepping down. So Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he starts out with this very uh, superfluous greeting. We know that you are a teacher who has come from God for no one could perform the miraculous signs you have. That may have been a, a, a genuine response or maybe it was a bit of patronage. I don't know that, that Nicodemus was coming. Uh, it would have been typical 
in their world to start with a, a, a complimentary greeting like that. Uh, Jesus, as he often does, doesn't respond to what Nicodemus says directly, but he comes right out, comes right to the point and says, I tell you the truth, a man must be born again or he will not see the kingdom. Jesus knew, of course, who Nicodemus was, knew about the Pharisees. The Pharisees were leaders and they were in charge of the temple as with any group. There were several uh, subgroups in the Jews. The Pharisees were responsible for the temple, its maintenance, its worship there, uh, making sure the people adhered to the law. And the Pharisees believed that the laws that, uh, that concerned worship in the temple should be carried out beyond the temple. They also believed in oral tradition that not only the written word of the Korah and the Talmud, but oral teaching and tradition. And so they had uh, a lot of uh, rules, really. They laid on the people a lot of interpretations of what they could do and couldn't do, and they were very strict, and people were to, uh, to follow those. The Pharisees did believe in resurrection from the dead. Uh, however, we have indications through some of their writings that they believed that only the soul was resurrected. If you recall later in the in, uh, book of Thessalonians, it talks about how we shall bodily be raised and joined with our spirit when Christ returns. They believed in the soul, and there's some indications they believe that that soul of a person would enter another person, and so there were some elements of reincarnation, which there's nothing in the Bible that teaches that reincarnation takes place. So that's kind of who the Pharisees were. But they were generally liked by the people. They did uh, respond to uh, the temple worship. But there was another group called the Sadducees. The Sadducees tended to be the aristocrats of the religion, perhaps uh, wealthy in that endeavor. They tended to be more arrogant. They did not believe in life after death. They did not believe in the resurrection of the body at all. And they were, for the most part, not liked by the Jewish people. And then finally, another group that was in favor was the scribes and the sages. These people were responsible for the synagogues, and it's in the synagogues that the children were taught the scriptures and other matter. And so these were popular among the people, and they later became known as the rabbis of the day. So we had these three groups. Nicodemus was a Pharisee, and Jesus comes to him with this challenge, you must be born again. And Nicodemus expresses confusion. How can that happen? How can a man be born when he is old? How can he enter back into his mother's womb? Certainly a, an impossible feat. And it makes me wonder of Nicodemus' actions again. Was he being kind of flippant? Was he being sarcastic? Or genuinely seeking? What do you mean by this? It, uh, that's uh, for an, uh, a, an older man, an educated man, to bring up that argument that he knew was an impossibility almost makes me think he was being a little argumentative and, and debating, which was typical in the Hebrew, Hebrew circles. So he asked that question, and, and Jesus, of course, responds that a, uh, and down in uh, verse 5, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, unless a man is born of water, born of a woman, we all understand that process about the water breaking and uh, the, the fetus being encased in water. So that's a very apropos ex example. And Jesus says, flesh gives birth to flesh. Okay. However, the spirit gives birth to spirit. And Jesus is saying that in order to enter the kingdom, we needed to be born of the flesh. We've got to be born. We've got to be alive, certainly. But then we need to be infilled with the spirit. And Jesus, of course, was the first one that this happened to. He was born of a woman, 
but he was also born of the Holy Spirit, that him being God. So that made him this God-man, this man of, of uh, flesh and spirit. And he's saying each one of us need that. And so Jesus goes on explaining this. And as we read this, I want to make out one point. That when it keeps saying here that a, a man must be born of water, the Greek word there would have been anthropos, meaning all mankind, men and women. It's not gender specific in this case, and that's the case through much of the Bible. It's only done as a literary uh, efficiency to use man. It's not pointing out or picking on men or omitting women. It's just a literary device. And so that's what Jesus is saying here. And then he goes on to teach how we don't know where the wind comes from, and so it is with the Spirit. We don't see it. We don't have evidence of it, except when it infills a person and, and it is inside them. And this would have been very easy and very knowledgeable for the Jewish Pharisee, in this case Nicodemus, to understand, and it harkens back to Genesis 1-2, when God created Adam. And it says that he formed Adam from the dust of the earth. And Adam was laying there, a creation, but not alive. And the, and the Bible tells us in, Hebrew, in uh, Genesis 1-2 that God breathed into Adam. And it was that eternal spark, that eternal spirit. And once he did that, Adam came to life. And, and Nicodemus would have been very familiar with this. And so there is this picture here of what happened with Adam at creation needs to happen with each one of us once we come to know who Jesus Christ is. And we've talked about before what happened there is when Adam and Eve sinned, that spirit component of man died and became dead to God, came unaware of God and did not even seek out God. And so when God comes to each person as he does to quicken them so that they might understand their need for salvation, he quickens that spirit, that eternal spark in man enough to sense that God-shaped vacuum that only Jesus Christ can fill. And so in the Hebrew, the word was ruach, of this breath of God that flowed into man, that brought him to life. And in Greek, as in our passage there in, in John, it's pneuma, the word for breath. And it, it is this picture, not just of a wind, but of God's eternal breath coming into man. And it brings us life. It brings us from deadness to Christ to life and then we can respond to his calling upon our life. And God sends us someone to tell us about him and about our need for him. So Jesus is spreading, giving all this information to Nicodemus, explaining this process. But it seems Nicodemus is still confused. And Jesus often did this when he was approached by people. They would come asking one question, a very practical question, and Jesus would respond with an answer that seemed to not apply or was perhaps even confusing because Jesus responded in reference to the kingdom of God and to the things of God and to the spiritual nature. That was what he was driving towards, not that that practical question that's on people's minds so much. And it seems here in verses 9 through 15 that Jesus was chiding or maybe even chastising Nicodemus a little bit. He was an expert in the law. That means they had studied the Old Testament. They knew the Old Testament. That's all they had in the day, of course. And the Old Testament testifies that a Messiah would come and testifies about where he would come from, the miraculous signs he would perform. So if anyone should have recognized Jesus, that it would have been the Pharisees or these experts in the law. The trouble is, as we believe, is that 
there are in the Old Testament two pictures of the Messiah. One is the suffering servant. Isaiah talks about so much that suffering Messiah. The other is a Messiah that comes riding in on a white horse, slaying all the enemies and ushering in the kingdom of God. And of course, that's the Messiah that the people were looking for. They had been under oppression under different nations for many years. Now they were under Roman oppression and they hated the Romans. The Romans were pagans, of course. Uh, if they worshipped anything, it was Zeus and Mars and all those Grecian gods and Roman gods. And so they were looking for a military savior to come, defeat their enemy, and usher in a new kingdom for Jerusalem, which will come, but it is yet to come. Jesus came first as the suffering Messiah who took our sins upon himself and died on the cross so that we might have victory over death and later would come victory over all the oppressors. So part of their struggle in the Pharisees is they, were, they had these two pictures of the Messiah and either they didn't understand there was a time frame between them or they just didn't want to accept that and they wanted the kingly Messiah so much that that's who they were looking for. So when Jesus came, and he wasn't that when he first came to earth 2,000 years ago, they dismissed him and they didn't accept him as the Messiah. And in fact, Orthodox Jews today are still waiting for the Messiah to come. So whatever it is, Nicodemus was not understanding this concept, accepting this truth. And so Jesus was saying, how can you teach others when you don't understand? And to Nicodemus' credit, he did come to Jesus and he came asking questions and he had this discourse, so many would not do that. At the end of that passage, Jesus brings up a prophecy of sort when he says it's necessary that the Son of Man be lifted up. And to be lifted up was a euphemism for crucifixion on the cross. The crucifixion was so horrible, of course, it was performed by the Romans. The Jewish leaders were not allowed to exercise that type of punishment over people. That's why when Jesus was tried, the Jewish leaders had to go before the Roman court and make an argument of why Jesus should be crucified. But when that decision was made, it was the Romans who effected it. And it was a horrible death. And, and you've heard the recounts of uh, people on the cross, and especially Jesus, that nails were driven through, not their hands, but through their wrist, so that the bones would hold them. A nail would pull through the fleshy part of the hand, so they were suspended with a nail by their wrist. And then they were put on the cross with a little bit of a bend to their knee and their legs were put one on top of the other and a spike driven through the top of their feet. And that allowed them, even in their pain, to push themselves up because as they hung by their wrist, it restricted flow in their neck to where they couldn't breathe. And so with that little bend in their knee, they could push up, take a breath, and then out of fatigue, of course, they'd have to settle back down. But they could continue this for several days, and it was an agonizing death, and their raw back is scrubbing under the wood of the cross. But of course, as they came around, they would typically pierce the people with a sword in order to hasten their death, but when they came to Jesus, he had given up his spirit and died. It was a horrible death, and they didn't want to speak of crucifixion, so they called it being lifted up. And Jesus is teaching this, that he must be lifted up, and the people needed to look upon him and believe in order to be saved and ushered into the kingdom. And again, Jesus is hearkening back to an Old Testament account, Numbers 21, where as the, the Israelites are wandering in the desert, 
they're wandering because of their sin. They hadn't believed God. They hadn't followed God. They could have entered right into the Canaan land. They, they, they didn't believe what God said, so they were wandering. And in one of their periods of sinfulness, God allowed venomous snakes to attack the camp and many people died and the people cried out to Moses they realized their sin they realized their disbelief and they said Moses intercede for us and Moses did and God said for Moses to make a bronze snake mounted on a pole to lift it up and that as the people came and looked upon that bronze snake they would be healed and saved Seems like an odd occurrence, seems like an odd thing for God to do. But it again was a foreshadowing. As the people came and looked upon that snake, they had to look upon what they feared, what they hated, what they rejected in order to receive healing and salvation. And so it is as they come to Jesus Christ on the cross, and Jesus refers to it in the end that he is light. Men are living in darkness and they don't want the light to illuminate their sins and their, their evil. So they reject Jesus Christ. They reject the life. But in order to have a saving experience, they need to look upon the cross and believe in him who came, taking their sins upon himself, and then carrying through the grave for resurrection. You know, I think about as Nicodemus came and asking these questions, it has struck me many times, this is a unbelievable story. And to summarize quickly, that there was, there was this supreme being who has always existed, and at one time there was nothing, no earth, no universe, not even time. And that this supreme being we call God spoke and he had previously created angels and some angels followed him, some angels rebelled against him and fell. And he spoke in Genesis 1-1 and created the heavens and the earth and we have the creation account. And through those different events, God created all of this. And at one time, he walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. When they were first created with that breath of God, they were perfect. They were sinless. But they had the ability to sin, the ability to disobey. And Satan, who hated God, tempted them and got them to choose their own way instead of God's way. And sin entered them and entered mankind. And for thousands of years, God taught all of us, taught those alive, how they should live in order to be perfect before God, but it was impossible. And God had to set into a plan a way for man to be redeemed. And the only way that could happen is for a perfect man to take on the sins of the people as a scapegoat, as a, as a sacrifice for them, and carry him to the grave. Well, no man could be perfect. It seemed hopeless. And so Jesus came, taking on the form of man, satisfying that requirement, and he took. And if, if you'll just imagine the weight of this, when Jesus was on the cross, he took on himself the sins of everybody that had ever lived because their sins could not be forgiven. He took on the sins of everybody that was alive at that time, and he took on the sins of everybody that was ever going to live. Tremendous weight. And when all that sin comes upon him on the cross, the Father cannot look on him. And Jesus felt that, and that's when he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because God can't look upon sin. And, but then Jesus died. He carried those sins. He paid the price. The Bible teaches us that without blood, there can be no remission of sin. Jesus did that. And the Bible tells us that when he was there in the tomb, there in the grave, he descended into the pit 
and he set the captives free. Those captives were the ones who had tried to live righteously up until the time of Christ. They couldn't go to heaven because Christ hadn't died for them, so they were in a place you've heard of called paradise or Abraham's bosom. Jesus descended. He now had died for their sins. They all ascended to the Father. And since that time, those who believe in him ascend to the Father upon death. Tremendous story. Fantastic story. It's easy to see why somebody would say, whoa, that blows my mind. How can that be? But it's true. And each one that has accepted Christ as Savior can testify within themselves that God is powerful and effective and hears me and lives for me and me for Him. And so Nicodemus is learning this lesson and Jesus is giving this lesson to them and to us by extension. And then... Very important. I I love John 3.16, but I really love John 3.17. It says, For Christ did not come into the world to condemn the world. He was the supreme judge. He was the only one who could condemn people for not believing in him, but he didn't come to condemn. He came to save And he did that in giving his own life in order to effect that and to suffer all of the torture, the abuse at the hand of man in order that we might know salvation. And he makes the point that he doesn't come to condemn because we stand condemned already. Because of the sin nature in our life, that nature that that just does wrong when we don't want to do wrong, that does wrong without explanation sometimes, or even that pure evil that's in the world. And we know some people that embody that. The condemnation is already present. That Jesus doesn't condemn us to hell. He comes and saves us from it. He provides a bridge from that chasm. He leads the captives free. And that is the beauty of this verse. God loved the world. And when we think of that, we think of the world universal. And that's true. God loves everybody in the world. But the Bible often uses the world to represent those people who have not believed in Jesus Christ. Those people who are living according to to the desires of the flesh. And, in, and I believe that's the deeper meaning here. When we read Scripture, it is great depth there. There's a surface understanding, but as we grow in knowledge and wisdom, we see more and more truth. God loves the world, but He loves the world as in those who do not know Him. And rather than say they're not worth it, I'm going to let them go on to their condemnation, to their separation. Before time began, God instituted a plan to bring each one of us to a saving knowledge, to eternal life, to a life of abundance, to an eternal hope of life in the kingdom. That's what John 3.16 says to us. And those of us who have called upon His name, if God loved the world that much, should we not love it too? Should we not seek out those who don't know Him and display the love of Christ, the truth of Christ, the life of Christ to them so that we save them from a life of separation? If you knew somebody, I I would really hope if you knew somebody that was headed down a path of destruction, whether it be drugs, drinking, uh, some other type of lifestyle, whether it was a, a young person who was driving too fast and you knew that an accident was going to occur one day, that you would do your best to try to intercede and stop them from that behavior. 
and even lesser if you just know they're making financial decisions that are going to make life difficult. Wouldn't you try to teach them how to manage their finances? Wouldn't you care enough to try? You can't make them do anything, but rather than ignore them, I would hope that you would step in where you could by example, by word. It's no different on salvation. People without Christ are heading to an eternity of separation from God. And, and yes, there are words like hell and lake and fire and brimstone, and that's horrible and terrible. But to me, the, the, the greatest tragedy is to think of never having any influence of God for eternity. You see, even people today who do not believe in God have the benefit of others who do. They have others who do right, others who help, others who establish laws that protect and preserve. And just the general spirit, the goodness. But that day is coming if they continue to reject Him that they'll be forever perpetually separated from any other goodness of God. And that's, that's worse than anything you can imagine. He is good and perfect. And God calls upon us to be his ambassadors, to reach out. Jesus said in John fifteen sixteen, You did not choose me, I chose you to bear fruit, fruit that will last. God calls us to care like he cared to show love to those, to each one, everybody, but love to those of the world that do not know him so that they may enjoy the riches of life with Christ in heaven.